to say uh, um, amazing contributions from all our speakers, some really interesting insights. Um, I think uh, I'll just quickly use, um, you know, uh, as chair, uh, quickly just ask one question and then I'll try and go out to other people uh, and for people to, to, to shout out various organizations as well. Um, one of the questions that I'd like to ask is just in respect of um, some of the uh, organizing efforts of LSWU in trying to organize in detention centers in the UK. Um, uh, we're trying to like organize detention because uh, obviously in immigration detention as also it happens in prison uh, people are required to work um, they are paid pennies barely anything um, and it's not particularly uh, it's not particularly great work um, at all uh, in fact like during the pandemic they were often having to essentially uh, maintain their own conditions in the detention center uh, for some, to some extent they were required to clean the areas around them and, and engage in that kind of work um, so I guess like one of the things that uh, we wanted to do from this is kind of draw from organizing efforts across the board so this idea of like not being siloed and understanding what's going on everywhere else to try and like inform our efforts going forwards um, so that's like I guess that was what, what was in our minds and um, so we really wanted to kind of learn more and then kind of build on that um, so I guess one of my questions would be like what's in terms of the law the law as it stands and in terms of and, and organizing um, how, sh what, what, what should our priorities be, I guess, as people who can understand and access certain legal tools? Um, do we try and use the law? Do we just try and change it? Or should we try and focus more on organizing, on, you know, organizing detention workers, for the people in detention or workers, and, and trying to understand how workplace organizing for us as legal sector workers might impact upon the wider system as well? Like, if, if you have any insights on that, does anyone want to? start I don't know whether Michael you want to you want to start given that you know a bit more about it yeah go for it yeah thank you um th th this issue is one that is very close to my heart um uh not just my experience of it but also this connects to I think something that uh Una I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right but um was talking about earlier um it's, it also you know happens in a, in a prison system so uh, in prisons and in detention centers, the detainees or prisoners are the ones that are in the kitchen doing the cooking, they're the ones cleaning, they're the ones um, assisting people in the library, whatever is there it is maintained by um, detainees or prisoners. And in, in detention centers, uh, individuals pay one pound, a, you know, a pound an hour, but you, you I mean, the whole idea that you're not, you're not allowed to work while you're in the community, but yet you can uh, work for one pound an hour, that's, that's somebody basically uh, taking advantage and using you as a slave. You know, let's, let's call it what it is. Um, but it's also, um, it connects to um, uh, uh, Lamine, what Lamine was talking about. So this whole idea that, that because of where you are and, you, and your circumstances, you are, are not allowed to work. So we have criminality and we have access to the job market. So the way the system works is basically to impose this thing on you by first character assassination, by destroying the image of the migrant within the press, right? Uh, and one of the biggest tools, or, or one of the biggest successful tools using that is criminalization, saying, oh, these people are criminals, or they're dangerous, or they're this, right? Which then uh, make the public feel anxious or unsympathetic. Now, whilst that individual is not allowed to work, the only way here in the UK, or in, the, in, any, in, any, in, in any other developing world, to survive is through work because our system, our capitalist system, um, requires an individual to trade your labor for money or whatever. Now, if you restrict an individual that, you're basically, basically giving that individual two choices. One is to steal or to just sit in a corner somewhere and die. Now, it's a, it's a human nature to want to survive. That is, that is our, we want, everybody wants to survive. 
And actually that is torture in its, in its clearest form by refusing somebody that very right. So the criminalization, actually, when I, uh, I, when I speak to a lot of politicians uh, to, to lobby them, they say, oh, Michael, but we can't really talk about FNOs because I can't sell that to my constituent. I said, I'm not here to ask to sell anything. The very reason why you have FNOs, majority of them, is because of the policies. It's the policies that drive people to be forced to work on the streets or to be forced to commit crime, which then becomes a catalyst for why they are not allowed to remain here in the UK. I, 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 I strongly believe that to challenge this system, we must basically um, uh, support all the different organizations must give uh, our support to the legal, radical legal individuals who are willing to do the work and basically call this what it is. It is the same way as the slave trade, okay? Let's not make no mistake about it. The way to use uh, f uh, free labor is if you go in, in, in the States, they say everybody is free, but if you're in prison, your labor is free. You're, you're basically a slave. We are using it, the same model here, right? Because if an individual is not allowed to work, there is an, um, under, an, um, uh, a market that exists also that 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 um uh then takes these individuals um labor and give them almost next to nothing and to challenge that these issues has to be brought on the forefront these issues has to be on the forefront and we have to basically call them out what it is the racist the 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 unhumanistic values and that's how we we must look at them that's how we must approach them not by individuals but you know collectively thanks for that michael that's that's really yeah really helpful um i think the way that yeah it's uh, as essentially i think it's quite interesting as well to talk about the immigration detention estate and how the the prison estate actually works in collaboration to some extent um on this and uh, especially how like for example the home office touts itself as the the biggest you know um the biggest uh, the most prevalent sorry uh, anti modern slavery and anti trafficking or like entity across the world and yet they are within within those systems forcing people to work for for next to nothing um uh, i think una are you okay to come in on this a little bit if that's okay as well yeah sure um i don't think i have anything yet uh anywhere near as comprehensive as, as michael's point just there but um i think on the question of should we be focusing on legal challenges or organizing um for me i think the priority always has to be organizing and building up greater and greater numbers of um people who are ready and able to take action i think governments break the law governments can change the law there's always ways around when we can when we implement a reform uh, whether that's through the law or through policy there are ways that uh, people in power in the systems tend to have to kind of find a way around that and to find a way to like re-solidify the power and and continue to implement the original purposes of that system through another method so i think the only the only possible way to safeguard against that and to keep building towards abolition um you know to keep pushing for those non-reformist reforms towards abolition is to put all of the energy into organizing and there are so many ways that uh legal tools legal strategies can and must support that work but i think the the priority always must be the organizing Yeah, thanks for that. I think that's uh, important. So there's just a message in the chat that just says exactly why we need revolution. Well, that's that's it's definitely one approach. Um, <laughs> uh, in, uh, cool. Uh, sorry. Uh, in terms of like another question that I think uh, I'd like to ask, um, just uh, I think I, I, I'll ask it just because of the ways in which kind of law firms uh, and uh, chambers, for example, uh, I guess as lawyers, one of the things we do in continuing to be part of the system is continue to have a reason to have a job essentially I remember one conversation that we had in LSWU about the idea that in immigration law what we're trying to do is essentially trying to get rid of our jobs because for the most part immigration um, 
immigration is like quite a difficult area and so having to navigate that requires us to, to exist. So I guess like one of the things I'd ask is um, how, in terms of Michael's point about the, and, and I think there was a comment in the chat as well about um, uh, how non-governmental organizations and charities uh, and firms, solicitor firms often treat um, migrants, refugees and asylum seekers as commodities, as a way to kind of like, um, extracts from them uh, some resources from them or the state and then try and like argue their case whilst arguing the case is a good thing obviously that means that they are relying on that individual as a number and, and having to get as many cases as possible through and I know there have been many cases where um, people's cases have been entirely messed up because the law firm hasn't really been qualified to deal with it um, as well so I, I guess like what I'm trying to say is this idea of like the collaboration between um, non-governmental entities. I don't know if anyone wants to come in on that or whether that's even clear. Apologies for my, for my lack of clarity, but does anyone want to come in on kind of collaboration between charities and and firms? I can make, I mean, I suppose not on the, on necessarily on the collaboration, but I think like the point that you're making, Fahim, is absolutely right um, about the way in which a lot of NGOs, especially some of the bigger um, sort of frontline organisations supporting migrants, have this incredibly like white saviour victim narrative of they come in and they're going to support these vulnerable poor people um and you know that's that's they're relying on that kind of narrative a lot of the time for their funding um and because they're sort of not i suppose politically where we maybe are um i think i mean at migrants organize that's certainly like one of the things that attracted me to the organization is that that is that recognition about what we do is we try we organize with migrants who you know in order for them to take action about the issues that are affecting them and that we provide support and a platform for them to do that and what so we have the side of the organization that provides casework support but that and that's a recognition that you know in this system people do need casework casework support because the immigration law is so bloody complex that nobody can understand it but it's about empower like empowering i mean i hate that word but giving people the tools to you know have their basic needs met um you know in a system where people have hardly enough money to feed themselves their children whatever um ensuring that they have access to housing so and you know the ba their basic needs are met so that they can then do and be supported to do the organizing work um i think that's really really important and i think increasingly as again as i kind of mentioned as this government gets more fascistic and a lot of these um NGOs I think can sometimes stand in the way of more radical organizing strategies it is quite important that we call them out um, and that we say you know actually we need a mass a mass organizing strategy which doesn't pit us uh, you know and, and migrants as as victims um, uh, you know as without agency um, and instead actually with the ones who are like leading these fights and these struggles um, Thanks, Alia. That was a far better articulation than my question. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, I think I think what I was trying to get at was this lack of like agency afforded to individuals once they are co-opted by the charity sector. Uh, yeah, so that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, was there anyone else that wants to come comment on that or uh, at all? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Un sí, puede decir. Bueno, eh, yo creo que eh, uh, como el, uh, la, la evolución y la modernización, es, todos esos cambios van muy rápido, muy rápido. Y nosotros eh, como movimientos sociales eh, activistas está, estamos muy atrás y no, no buscamos tácticas nuevas, que es muy necesario hacerlo. Y, por ejemplo, nosotros en el año pasado lo que hemos hecho es eh, invitar a 20 artistas que son muy famosos, muy conocidos y hemos reunido con él, le hemos eh, expuesto eh, todos los pro, eh, problemas eh, eh, que vivimos aquí, los problemas de los migrantes, eh, los problemas de las leyes, todas esas, que muchas, aunque son famosos, que están con, muy conocidos en, en, en muchas partes del mundo, tienen muchísimos seguidores también. Hemos hablado con ellos eh, y a partir de esta charla eh, han hecho unos uh, unas, uh, diseños y en unas uh, jaquetas y con eso hemos hecho una campaña muy grande y que eso nos, nos ayuda a que nuestro mensaje 
podría llegar a otros públicos, porque no hay que comunicar solo con el público que, de, de, que, que, que se mueve en el tema del, del antirracismo, pero también hay que buscar una manera de conquerir otros espacios. Y eso nos han permitido a conquerir otros espacios. Porque dentro de, de estos 20 eh, seguidores, uh, de estos uh, diseñadores muy famosas, ¿tienen seguidores? Um, so, the first thing was to say that, yeah, part of the issue is that it seems like changes happen really quickly, like the way that the system evolves happens really, really quickly to the point that it feels like we're always on the back foot, like we're always reacting and, and we don't look for new strategies, like we're not, we're not leading the fight, we're always reacting because things change so quickly. And like one example of something that the, the, the union did to try to get ahead in this way or to try to um, use a new strategy was that last year they invited 20 really famous uh, artists and um, they asked them to design and they and they have like loads of followers and they asked them to and that even though they're famous they they agreed to like do some designs for jackets and for clothing that is sold in the in the shop and the brand of the union and with this campaign it was a way of reaching a different kind of public because it's not good enough to just keep speaking to um, like-minded people, people from social movements, people who are allies, people who are also in, in the struggle, but this enabled us to kind of conquer a new space. Um, and that's what we got to. Y eso nos han, nos han ayudado que nuestro mensaje ha llegado a otros públicos que no sabían lo que, lo que es la ley de San Gerias, no, que no sabían lo que es uh, las trabas administrativas, no sabían el racismo o algunos tipos de racismo que existe en este país y eso es muy importante. This this kind of thing allows us to get our message to other public spaces that didn't even know what immigrate the immigration law was necessarily that didn't know the things that we were living and like he's saying this is really important it's vital that we do this kind of work. Amazing, thank you. Says I could speak more than two Michael, hours. did you want to come in on this? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really good. It's really, really good. I feel like we should have you back again. Like, this is so interesting. Um, Michael, do you want to come in? Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree uh, to having him back. Absolutely. Um, so, I, I uh, we also have to focus on the law and the way, and the way in which laws are enacted. So, in the UK, I think roughly about 100 new laws come into force every year. If the legal sector is working um, uh, you know, with, with civil societies to basically dissect and, and really um, uh, work out what the implementation, what these laws are going to affect people's lives are going to be like, and challenge those things before they, they, they become the law. So, we, rather than being on a back foot, if we can have that access and we can have, um, uh, you know, individuals like, you know, Lamin, Esper by Spirit, people who are going through these things to actually ha have, the, have those things explained to them, they'll be able to have a much bigger input and be able to see how those things are going to affect their life. That way, we have a chance to challenge those things before they, 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 are being, uh, they become enforced on us. We also have to work to make sure that individuals in the migrant sector are included in policy making. We can't continue to make you know, policies to affect people that nobody hear their voices. If you have a group of you know, 60 year old men stuck in a room make, making laws on abortion, it will be useless. Even if, even if it's coming from a good place, those laws will be useless. So we have to be radical in our in our thinking in challenging. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, uh, I'm aware that we only have a few moments left, but it would be cool if any uh, of the speakers want to have like a final like line to kind of lead out to kind of give the audience uh, and I guess us uh, just a little bit of like a 
what do you think we should be doing? Obviously, we should, ob of course, be going to, to sign up for the Freedom Law Project everywhere we can uh, and supporting the various organisations. But just like a one-liner, just shout out to any organisations or just, yeah, anything you want to say just as a final outro, I guess. Um, shall we start with uh, um, Helen again, maybe? Um, hi. I mean, I'm just digesting everything that's been said and it's been so valuable and rewarding being here. I don't have an outro so much as just wanting to say thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, and all the comments that are coming through, I'm literally copying and pasting them into documents so I can like read over them later. Um, so yeah, this has been so useful. I mean, my one kind of wish would be to be in touch with everyone and continue this conversation and yeah, find out, find ways in which we can organize together and can um, continue this work and discussion. So thanks. And solidarity to everyone working. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's wicked. That's a good, that's a good way off. Yeah. Um, and de I think definitely we'll be able to keep, continue to collaborate and organize together um, through LSWU stuff. Um, like we've already started to work a little bit with uh, Migrants Organize and we're trying to work with other, with other entities. There are some really rad, rad legal sector workers uh, in our little union and, and I'm quite excited uh, for what happens next. Um, um, Michael, do you want to say a little like, and shout out as well. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight the work that um, Ehid, um, uh, it, it's it basically, um, I don't have the link. I was looking for the link to share it just now. Um, I don't have the link. I'm a bit messy at the minute. Uh, so basically what they, as part of the Heathrow expansion, uh, the government was going to close the Harmersmith and um, uh, Collinbrook, which is, uh, a, a, a base in Heathrow, they were going to demolish those two and build a super detention center, you know, one of the largest in Europe. And what EHID has been doing from the forefront is basically uh, going to all the, all the communities uh, meetings to make sure that residents in the local area understand about the impact of these, of these issues. And they've been campaigning for a number of years. I can't take any credit because I've only attended a handful of meetings, but they've been really, 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 really excellent in challenging this thing before it even, they even get the right to build it. So, and I think that, that's one of the things that everybody should look into and, and support. I can um, have the details sent to you later on to share amongst everyone, but uh, it's really, really great work. And uh, Bill McKeith, who worked for, uh, nearly 30 years to help close down one of the first detention centers in the UK, in Oxford, uh, is, is actually um, a, one of the founding um, uh, uh, brains behind it all. Uh, the bill worked tirelessly to basic on all issues around immigration detention. And I think there are a, a, a many of you, Helen and the incredible Stanza 15 it has shown us an example of how we can really be radical in our in our in our um, 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 a, a, a challenge. Final thought: When I was um, released from detention center, I was I was sectioned in a mental health uh, institution in Newham. Um, soon after my release, and the funny thing is, I've still received. Uh, a bill. I still receive letters from the NHS telling me I owe them eight thousand pounds. So what I do is I I put I put it inside another envelope and I send it to the Home Office and I said this is your bill, not mine. So <laughs> so I just wanted to kind of like you know share that. I don't. It doesn't bother me every time I see. It. I just send it to them and say this is your bill. Please take care of it. You know I didn't I didn't I didn't go to this place <laughs> of my own willing. You know so this is one of the things that also uh, we don't have to comply to most of these things. You know but we need the support. We need some sort of support that kind of like you know keep people safe. Yeah. Uh, thank you and um, Lamine. Much love.
much love. I can't say more, but much love. Uh, amazing. Uh, I, also, I love that story of non-compliance, like send the bill to the, the home office. Technically, you should be it's a terrible place detention. Um, you shouldn't have it. Um, sorry, uh, Lamin, do you want to do you want to say something just as an outro as well at all? Like, do you want to like say a final thing? Because there's a lot of love for you here. Got, got to be honest. <laughs> Bueno, es que eh, el, el mensaje que quiero eh, enviar a, a las personas sin papeles eh, por ahí y lo que quiero que entiende lo que quiere el sistema. Y ellos también tienen que saber lo que quieren ellos. Y mm, quiero que, en, eh, que entiendan ya eh, que mm, lo que quiere decir es lo que quiere el sistema, limitarlo, eso no es real. Es, Es, es falso, no hay límites. No, no tienen que aceptar que el sistema le ponen un, una, una barrera. Hay que intentar romper las barreras. Porque lo que quiere el sistema siempre que nosotros seamos la mano barata del sistema y que, eh, lo que quiere el sistema que sus hijos uh, sean los policías, sean los abogados, sean los ministros y nosotros seamos uh, la energía que alimenta el sistema capitalista. Uh, porque lo que quiere el sistema capitalista siempre son uh, personas vulnerables que, que aportan más uh, para el Estado y reciben uh, en contra una, una recompensa como encarcelamiento, uh, multas y persecución. Por eso que nos meten uh, con sus leyes en una, un túnel sin salida y tenemos que intentar romper eso ya. Es que eh, aunque voy a comer en la basura, no voy, no voy a meterme en un camino equivocado porque me están controlando eh, en cada minuto. Entonces no puede hacer algo que no conoces eh, la, el, el gobierno porque me están controlando. Entonces no tengo que aceptar a meterme en ese camino. Siempre tengo que eh, que guardar la conciencia, aunque voy a comer en la basura, no voy a meterme a hacer otra cosa. Voy a seguir utilizando mi, mi, eh, mi mentalidad, resistir eh, y siempre utilizar mi, eh, lo, que, lo que tengo, porque cada persona tiene, una, eh, tiene un don dentro de él mismo que puede sacar y que eso puede ser útil con... Uh, con él. Es lo que hemos hecho nosotros porque no teníamos derechos uh, de trabajar y hemos buscado uh, de, en, dentro de los huecos de las leyes de formar una asociación, de superar uh, las trabas administrativas, de saltar, saltar uh, las barreras que nos han puesto las, uh, uh, las leyes y poder uh, imponernos uh, frente al sistema. Um, the message that I want to send to people without papers in the UK is that there's a difference between what the system wants of you and what you want to like to not accept. The system wants to limit you and this isn't real. It's false. These limitations and these barriers that the system puts on you. The system wants us to be the, the cheap workers that um, that generates the energy that feeds capitalism. And the system wants its own sons to be politicians, to be police. What meanwhile, we are the ones that put the most energy and um, construct the most of this, of the capitalist system and the capitalist state. And, and that we, sh and that, um, ah, and on the other hand, like well e even though we're the ones who are putting the most energy and the most work into the construction of this system and that it like is built off our backs we receive in exchange incarceration fines all of this violence and it puts us into a tunnel without an exit so the thing that i want to say to people is that you know like even if you have even if i have to eat from the bins I won't accept what the system wants of me and what the government wants of me. And even if I have to eat from the bins, I will keep um, 
keep my mentality of resistance and keep struggling and that everybody can do something useful in this way you know like we we had no right to work we had no legal ability to do what we did and we managed to find some small hole some small holes in this legal infrastructure where we were able to to find a way to keep to fight no? Amazing. Um, yeah, that's, oh gosh, can't even comment on it. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that, for that amazing outro. Um, uh, Ina, do you want to, do you want to do a quick outro as well? So oh, I'm, I'm not going to try and add to that. I don't think it's anything I possibly could. Um, all I'm going to do is just put a link in the chat to the writing of one of our members of the Prisoner Solidarity Network um, called John Bowden. He spent 40 years in prison and was released this year and while inside prison he uh, he wrote a lot and a lot of the things that he has written generally short essays and um, really touched on a lot of the themes that we talked about today um, so I just really encourage you to go and read what he's written if you want some inspiring things take them from someone who spent time in prison and not, not from me um, and he's also around if you ever want a speaker about um, about prison and abolition and particularly prisoner organizing. Um, so just thank you to everyone. Thank you to the organizers and the other speakers. Um, it's so valuable to have a space like this to discuss strategy in depth. Um, so thanks. Thanks so much, Gina. And yeah, we'll definitely keep uh, keep mind on that speaker. We'll definitely keep in touch. Um, Ali, do you want to do a final final outro? Yeah, I'm also not going to try and add too much to what's already been said, which has been phenomenal. And again, thank you to Haldane and LSU for having us and hosting this discussion. And the chat has just been so amazing. I've saved it and hopefully everyone will get a copy because it is really interesting. Um, I guess the only other thing to add is that if you're not already involved in this fight, now is the time to do it. Um, I think there are there is an increasing attack um, by this government and governments across the world on migrants, racialized people. Um, and I think it is time that we have all got to get together and use all tools at our disposal, at our disposal to fight back. Um, I, you know, I, I look to lessons from the US um, where, you know, law, particularly thinking about lawyers, um, where they, for example, when the Muslim ban came in, were both ready with both legal arguments to challenge it in court as soon as it was adopted, but they also turned up to airports where they were then helping people, um, you know, on the front lines. And I think that kind of direct action, frontline work is what we're going to increasingly need as we see, you know, the far right turning up to um, hostels where migrants are being housed, um, forming human chains outside those spaces is, is kind of, you know, the kind of work that we need um, to be doing at this point. Um, and I think it's only gonna gonna get worse. Um, but I think mass organizing is where we have to go and then it will get better. Um, I think, you know, in all, one of the things that's come out of this discussion today is that often the experiences of migrants are so invisible and they are deliberately so in order that people across society can't be in solidarity with them because they have no idea what's going on. Um, the, you know, the hostile environment is designed to make people powerless so that they can't speak out about what's going on for them because they live in fear that, that you know, they will as a result be deported or, or whatever else may happen. And actually it is our responsibility um, to be raising their voices and amplifying their struggles, which are um, ongoing and, as we've heard today, beautiful and powerful and will be ultimately what brings this system down. Um, so solidarity to everybody and thank you again for having us. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much to all of the incredible, incredible speakers. Um, and yeah, I think Ali, you're absolutely right. There is a need for a mass mobilization, not only just within the confines of the UK, it's actually going to be a global struggle. And yeah, the struggle against capitalism, the struggle against uh, the, the, the systematic dispossession of people, um, not only who are black and brown, but who are of different class dynamic. Like, I think there is uh, a huge struggle ahead of us and it's one that's been ongoing for a really long time uh, but you know in this in this like one conversation I can see there's so many voices that not only can help uh, but can actually 
give us yeah give us a bit of a conversation about what the strategy needs to be and who we need to be discussing uh, our, like our thoughts with and how we can build going forward so yeah thank you so much to all of you for, for taking the time out on a on a saturday afternoon saturday evening uh to kind of talk through this that's really really amazing of you all and definitely do keep in touch uh, again um at lsw you will be absolutely glad to have you again uh, i've absolutely enjoyed this panel and i really want to keep this conversation going um uh, in terms of uh, what we do next, I guess we'll continue discussing between ourselves. Uh, we'll hopefully have an article between us put out as well. So just a little bit about thoughts from this panel and thoughts going forward. Uh, apart from that, I guess uh, joy and solidarity to everyone in the struggle. Because whilst the yeah we we are gonna it's gonna be a really difficult fight, we are gonna need a little bit of joy, a little bit of happiness, a little bit of like comradeship uh, as we as we continue. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, I think, from my end, because I know that I've run over. Apologies for that, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, I'll leave it to them. So um, thank you for a no need to apologize. Um, my role now is as chair just to thank you in particular and all the panelists. Um, as a wise person once said, we do have a world to win. And with the people on this call, and with the support of Haldane and um, LSWU, I'm confident that we will help the international working class and we consider ourselves part of that and we do have a world to win. So one aspect from Haldane's point of view is to create a praxis arising out of this conference. It is to ensure that these links are brought forward in a practical way to help to use our skill or privilege to help um, our fellow citizens of the world. And that's what's so great about um, the union, United Voices of the World Union, and why um, some comrades within Haldane and others, a big shout out to Zach and Frank, set up LSWU within the framework of United Voices of the World. And just reflecting on today's conference, we evolved from movement for justice, direct action, explaining the solidarity that they'd shown, whether it's giving phone credits to um, detainees or protesting outside Yarlswood. We looked at the pushback against the way in which the Fortress Britain and Fortress EU are implementing racist and classist policies against migrants from Africa and from other parts of the world. We looked into the future with the way in which there is a need to anticipate climate migrants and the way in which that will change our societies. Maybe for the better if we um, bring more migrants into this country because of course we know that Britain had a big role to play in the imperialist um, outlook of this country and the manifestation of capitalism that imperialism had. And indeed, the way in which those consequences stretch out through generations should be known. And as speakers refer to, it is still manifesting in the immigration an asylum system today. And that <clears throat> led to the Windrush scandal and the way in which the um, hostile environment was conceived as such by uh, Theresa May. But of course, there was always a hostile environment for migrants in this country. And this country has been um, has been shaped for the better by migrants from all parts of the world. And that, that is uh, the revenge of empire and hopefully it will still um, persist. And with the climate emergency and the way in which comrades around the world are starting to organize ahead of COP26, Haldane will be part of that discussion and we will fight for a world to win. So I'd just like to emphasize again, my thanks for all the speakers for all those who attended give up their Saturdays but in a way they didn't give them up they invested in the future and um, solidarity to all who attended solidarity to 
all migrants, all the internationalist working class, and thank you for attending. <laughs>